Welcome everybody here to St. Guthlax Church in Fishtoft, part of our coastal cluster here in Lincolnshire. This is a, the Eucharist for the second Sunday after Trinity uh, for the 13th of June 2021. We're very pleased that you can join us here today. All the words you need should be available on the screen. And we're going to begin with the first of our hymns, Now the Green Blade Riseth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. We come to our prayers of penitence, so let's be quiet in our thoughts for a moment, recalling those things that we wish to confess to God and receive his forgiveness for today. We begin with an introduction. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. We have not always worshipped God, our Creator. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We have not always followed Christ, our Saviour. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We have not always trusted in the Spirit, our guide. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We spend a moment in quiet reflection before our special prayer for today, the Collect for the second Sunday after Trinity. Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. 
send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for your only Son, Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now we're going to have our first reading from the Bible. The reading this morning is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, commencing at the 6th verse. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen, rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Christopher. And so we come to our reading from the Gospel. Reading from St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 26. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Such a large crowd gathered around Jesus that he got into a boat and began to teach them using parables. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. And yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all the shrubs, and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is famous for his style of teaching, which, as we've heard, he often does in parables. A kind of story with important teaching enclosed within. You have to do a bit of work to understand the parables, and knowing the Bible a bit is very helpful. When we come to the two short parables we heard today, Jesus has already told the very famous parable of the sower, and he's explained it to his disciples, to whom he makes everything clear. But Jesus wants everyone to understand God's word. 
In Isaiah chapter 6 of his book in the Bible, God knows what will happen, but he speaks to Isaiah, and Isaiah goes and tells the people, and they don't listen. Or they can't be bothered to try and understand God's word or commit themselves to God. And so also Jesus knows that his words will often also fall on deaf ears, despite making the teaching very memorable and shine out in a parable, like a lamp on a lampstand. The teaching, however, is for everyone. All nations and people can come to God and learn what Jesus has to say. We know this from the second parable, which refers back to the books of the prophets Ezekiel and Daniel. All kinds of people find shelter in a lofty tree in those books in the Bible. And so it is in this parable. It shows us that even though the kingdom of God can be planted with a tiny seed, it can grow all over the world and welcome in many people. And so that's where knowing something about the Bible comes in, as Jesus' audience would have done. Very handy. Jesus' audience would have perhaps got these biblical connections. You might expect that building the kingdom of God needed specialist training and constant effort and vigilance. But Jesus in these parables says just the opposite. First, well, you just plant the seed. Jesus doesn't mention any preparation, although there might have been, but that's not the point here. As Mary Healy writes, with this parable, Jesus explains that the kingdom of God is a divine work, not a human achievement. God brings about its growth, which at times is imperceptible. We cooperate, but we cannot control or hasten the arrival of the kingdom by our efforts any more than the farmer can harvest his grain in January. St. Paul knew this principle well. I planted, Apollos watered, but God caused the growth. And therefore, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who causes the growth. The parable serves as an encouragement for those who think their efforts for the kingdom are fruitless, and a warning for those who think they can bring about the kingdom by their own projects and programs. The growth then comes from God. It isn't based on any great knowledge, just simple planting. And this is re-emphasized in the parable where the seed used is the mustard seed. Jesus exaggerates a bit for effect about the tiny seed and the massive plant, but the people listening would also have had a bit of a laugh as well because mustard seed bushes grew all around the lake that we call the Sea of Galilee where Jesus was teaching. They could have probably seen it uh, when they were standing there listening to him teach. They didn't really, in a sense, even need to be planted. But that just shows how easy it ought to be to plant the kingdom of God. It's not like some rare prize orchid or some of those plants that take a lot of you know, fiddly sort of uh, effort to keep them growing. This is a very common plant. And Jesus emphasizes the smallness of the seed, especially as compared with the resulting large bush that it grows into. When hearing about the kingdom of God, Jesus' audience might have expected something more powerful like rumbling thunder on the mountains as Isaiah describes the noise of a kingdom. And God's arrival is sometimes described in the Bible as, well, pretty terrifying. But Jesus goes against this idea here where the kingdom of God is a tree that provides shade and shelter for all. It grows literally automatically while the sower sleeps. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, it's simply the place where God rules. If God is sovereign, well then the kingdom is present. God is uniquely present in Jesus, and so where he is, there is the kingdom of God. That means for us as well that since Christ is present in the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, that the kingdom of God is also in some sense present. The Eucharist shows us God's love in action. Jesus dying on the cross for us all. That's what we are remembering. It is that love that drives the kingdom of God. If you try without love to bring in the kingdom of God, you will not succeed. Whether it looks successful or not, it is not God's kingdom. 
as St. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13, and as we're reminded in our colic today, we can do all kinds of amazing things, and it can look very spiritual, but without love, it's nothing. From simple, quite humble beginnings, like this kind of local teaching, wandering around the lake, Jesus' followers grew in number and in understanding. This parable tells us that this was God's work. Not because Jesus had a business plan, but because he loved them, as he does us. We do learn, of course, from these parables that we do have a responsibility to sow the seed of the kingdom. But whether there is growth, well, that's God's department. We do what we can, but the end results are up to God. But do take note that sowing is something that we all have to do. How we do that, of course, that's another question. But as I said, it must involve love and welcome, the hallmarks of Jesus. Even writing the Gospels was the work of many years for the people who actually knew Jesus. Working out the truths we now hold so important and so fundamental to Christianity took centuries. So in any sense, building the kingdom in those areas was a long job. There are ups and downs persecutions and power. Often the church and the kingdom grew when times were hard and we took things for granted when they weren't. The point here in both these parables is that you don't need to be a specialist with a special seed or great knowledge. You just sow ordinary everyday seeds and God does the rest. A very small amount of sowing takes place. It's not some great enterprise. There's no business plan, just some sowing. Jesus comes from the reassuring perspective of wisdom that in spite of our limited ways, God is making all things work together for good. Something small, simple and ordinary transforms into something great, majestic and life-giving. And this kingdom is open to all. What Jesus tells us about the growing of the kingdom of God means that when we are trying to grow the church, for example, we need to be aware that although the planting is up to us and perhaps making conditions favorable is a good idea, like watering, as St. Paul mentions, we cannot make the growth happen. If this is a spiritual thing, well then God is involved and God is in charge, not us. Amen. And now we're going to declare our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our intercessions this week are led by Angela Gilbert. Thank you, Angela. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for our lives and our families and the blessings you give us every day. We thank you for the nature around us, the trees, flowers, birds and animals. And we also thank you for the vegetables grown in the fields around us, which help to feed the people 
all over our country. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord God, rule our, in our hearts, direct our decisions, guide our actions. Let your kingdom grow in us, that we may live and work to your praise and glory. As we rejoice in the gospel, we pray for all who spread the good news, for evangelists and preachers, for Sunday school teachers and youth workers, for all the laity in their sharing of the faith. We pray for all who produce Bibles and those who help us to understand your holy word. Lord, may your church grow in holiness, in outreach and in number. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the written and spoken word. We pray for publishers and broadcasters, for politicians and leaders of nations. We pray for those who through meetings influence our lives, for all who make decisions about our world and our future, especially at this difficult time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with affection all who have helped us to grow physically, mentally or spiritually. We pray for teachers who have taught us, for churches that have enriched us, for loved ones who have sustained us. We pray for all whose growth for all whose growth is stunted, for all who lack love and attention, for all who suffer from neglect or abuse or homelessness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, sustain all who the world has hurt, those whose lives are denied natural growth, those who suffer from poverty, oppression or circumstance. We remember all who are frustrated by weakness, sickness or any other disability. When we pray for friends and loved ones in need, and in a few moments of quiet, we bring to you those people known personally who are ill or in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed are you, Lord God, for you give us the victory. We give thanks for all who are in sorrow and pain no more, all who have triumphed over death and the grave and are in life eternal. And we pray for loved ones departed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.
And so we share the peace of Christ with one another. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Be present, be present, Lord Jesus Christ, our risen High Priest. Make yourself known in the breaking of bread. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy, at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For he is your living word. Through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. To you be glory and praise forever. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. To you be glory and praise forever. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. To you be glory and praise forever. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. To you be glory and praise for ever. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. To you be glory and praise forever. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, 
we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. To you be glory and praise forever. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. Behold God's love for you. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. May this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. Behold, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. If you wish to join us for spiritual communion, please do follow the words on the screen at this point. In union, O Lord, with the faithful at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I present to you my soul and body with the earnest wish that I may always be united to you. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I humbly pray that you may enter spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you and embrace you with all of my soul. Let nothing ever separate you from me. May I live and die in your love. Amen.
what has passed our lips as food, O Lord, may we possess in purity of heart, that what has been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. Amen. Loving Father, we thank you for feeding us at the supper of your Son. Sustain us with your Spirit, that we may serve you here on earth until our joy is complete in heaven, and we share in the eternal banquet with Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we have our final hymn today, Will You Come and Follow Me? I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this service for the second Sunday after Trinity. We hope to be able to join with one another again very soon. Thank you. And so a blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.